Hello everyone and welcome to the game engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video we made a constant buffer class and today we are going to use it to send view and projection matrices to the GPU. We are also going to create a cache buffer where we'll put the cached data for rendering. When rendering the scene, we must provide the renderer with information such as which objects are visible, the lighting, object positions, screen dimensions, and so on. We use frame info data structure for this. However, the low level renderer needs more specific information which reflects the data in a format that's used by the low level renderer. That's why we need to translate the data in frame info to its low level counterpart, which we named the 3D12 frame info. Right now it doesn't contain much, except the view dimensions, so we need to add more data members. We start by adding a pointer to the original frame info, because there is some information in there that we can use without having to copy anything. We also have a pointer to the camera that's used to view the scene. This is the API specific camera. To avoid having to include the camera header in this file, we can forward declare the camera class. Next, we need the GPU virtual address of the global shader data. This is a pointer to a constant buffer that contains the view and projection matrices among other data. We already have the view dimensions, so we can continue with the current frame buffer index and the frame time. The frame time can be either the average frame time of the past few seconds or the frame time of the last frame that was rendered. I still haven't decided which one to use. Maybe we can add both frame times and use whichever is appropriate on the basis of the use case. And I guess this is all we need to add for now. In order to fill in this information, I'm going to write a function that takes the frame info and a few other parameters and returns an instance of the 3D12 frame info. Of course, first we need to add the frame info as a function parameter. That means that we need to change the signature of render surface function and update the function pointer type in the renderer interface as well. We also need to update the render function in the surface class. Now we can write our function that gets the D3D12 frame information. Here we need to fill in the global shader data, so that we can use its pointer. However, we haven't defined the global shader data type in our C++ code. In order to avoid defining the same data structures twice, once for shaders and once for C++, I'm going to add an HLSL header file, which can be shared between shaders and C++ code. To use a shared header in HLSL code, I add a common HLSL header that's included in any shader file that needs to use these types. And then we can put the common types in another header that's shared between both HLSL and C++ code. This header is not intended to be included directly in HLSL source files, so we need to trigger an error if that's the case.
Now we can add our data types. We already had a global shader data structure in our test shader and we can move it over to common types header. I will also move the per object data type while we are at it. We are not going to use this data in a structured buffer which has different packing and alignment rules from constant buffers. I will explain more about structured buffers when we use them, but as an example we can have a static assertion that checks if a data type is aligned properly for use in structured buffers. Obviously, this is only valid when we use this header in C++ code. In order to share these types, we can add a C++ header file and include the common types header in here. We can even put these types in their own namespace. Now the problem is that the shader types for vectors and matrices aren't defined in C++. We can resolve this by mapping our C++ types to these HLSL types. This is done rather easily, like so. We can include this header in core.cpp so that we have access to global shader data. We need to fill in the view and projection matrices, which is provided by the low-level camera. So we get a reference to the camera using its ID and update it. This will compute the view matrix and possibly the projection matrix. We can then store each matrix into our local copy of global shader data. I see we don't have a function that gets the camera position and direction. Let's add those now. First, we add two member variables to the camera class. Then we can put the position and direction that we get from the camera's game entity during update in these member variables. And we can simply add two accessor functions that get the position and direction. We can continue and fill in the rest of the global shader data. Next, we need to send this data to the GPU. To do so, we allocate a block of the constant buffer that's as big as the global shader data. Then we just copy the data using the good old memcopy. This is the recommended method of writing data to the constant buffer because it avoids accidental reading from the buffer, which is rather slow. 
Now we have everything we need to fill in our D3D12 frame info and return it. There is not much else to add in the render function at this moment. Looking at various steps in the rendering, we see that all submodules accept a D3D12 info, except for post-process step. So let's make this information also available to the post-process step. We can try to render the objects next. The first step is the depth prepass, which renders the scene only to the depth buffer. There is no pixel shader and render target attached to the pipeline. Before recording any commands, we need to prepare the current frame by gathering all information that we need for all render passes. We need to cache this information so that we can read everything sequentially. In the previous episode, we defined cache data types for submeshes, materials and render items. Now we need a cache container into which we can store the cached data. This is a simple byte buffer and we use a bunch of pointers to different offsets within this buffer. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Before anything else though, we need to know which render items we need to render. The IDs of all render items are collected in a vector. The number of items in this vector determines how big the cache is. In this cache, we have a pointer to an array of entity IDs. We can use this to find the transform matrices of each render item. Each render item points to a submesh, so we can also collect an array of submesh IDs, which we can use to look up the vertex and index buffers. Next is the array of material IDs for looking up the root signatures and textures, if any. We need two arrays of pipeline state objects, one for depth prepass and one for the gpass. Next are the arrays of root signatures, material types, position and element buffers, index buffers, primitive topologies and elements types. Finally, we have the constant buffer pointers to per object data. In order to calculate how big the cache buffer should be, we add all data sizes together. Multiplying this size by the number of render items will give us the total size of the cache buffer. I'll add a resize function that allocates a buffer if it's empty or too small to contain the cached data. As I mentioned, the new size of the buffer is the struct size times the number of render items.
If this size is larger than the current buffer size, we resize the buffer to this new size. We also need to set the data pointers to point to offsets within this buffer if the new size is different from the old size. To do this, we just cast each offset to the corresponding pointer type and assign it to the pointers. Of course we must not forget to update both the resize function and the struct size when we add new pointers to this cache buffer. Next we need some accessor functions that conveniently group these pointers together and return them to us. The first one is for render items. It returns the arrays of entity IDs, submesh GPU IDs, material IDs and the pipeline state objects for depth prepass and gpass. Next one is a views cache that returns the arrays of positions and element buffers, index buffers, primitive topologies, and elements types. And the last one for now is the materials cache, which returns the arrays of root signatures and material types. I'll also add a function to get the size of the cache and to clear it. We have got everything we need to write this function. In the next video, we are going to finish this function as well as finish writing the depth prepass and gpass render functions. Hopefully you enjoyed watching this video and if you found it useful, please consider subscribing to the channel so you don't miss the next videos when they come out. And if you liked the video, there is of course a button for that as well. Hint it a hint hint. As always, thank you so much for joining me today and I hope to see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!